Thank you, thank you. Hi, I'm Munjit. I would like to talk to you about my concept of the Wheel of Fortune. This, to me, symbolizes the dynamic and ever-evolving nature of life. Your, pos your position on this wheel, altered by many, or influenced by many factors. However, I learned that the main steerer is yourself. I suppose that I'm at the top of the wheel at the moment. That's why I'm here in front of you, otherwise you would invite me. And why is that? Maybe because I'm one of three surgeons worldwide that are pioneering this revolutionary technology called OCI integration. With this technology, I serve disabled people by making them half human, half machine. Similar to the Terminator movie, which is a movie that I watched at the age of 12 and inspired me to pursue passion of making this technology reality. With this radical treatment, I insert the residual part of the amputated limb to a robotic prosthesis. This gives an amputee a higher mechanical and functional capacity and a greater com comfort compared to a cumbersome, archaic style of Captain Hook socket prosthesis. Just to show you an example, this prosthesis was one of the earliest prostheses ever invented in the 15th century. And next to it is one of my patient prostheses before I offered him OC integration surgery. I do the surgery by inserting a high tensile strength, strength titanium implant into the residual skeleton. And what's more than that, I hook the residual soft tissue and nerves with myoelectric electrodes that, in a pattern recognition fashion, that allows the human to operate this robot with their mind. You can see Michael here, two months down the track after his surgery, operating this robot with this mind technology. And it brings him as close as possible to normality, even a bit better. <laughs> However, my wheel of fortune didn't start there. I was born in Baghdad. It was a cosmopolitan city, pretty much like Sydney. However, the fireworks were real. My family were second to the Iraqi throne, so I raised up with a silver spoon in my mouth. I learned a few valuable lessons early in my life, one of which sticks to my mind when our theology teacher told me the lesson of Abraham binding Isaac. I thought it was fascinating. I couldn't wait till I go home and tell my dad about it. And to my surprise, my father's response was, quote, what kind of father kill his son or act on killing his son if he was told to, even if it was God telling him? And he said to me, listen, son, always question and argue what you're given if your instinct tells you that it is not right. My wheel of fortune continued to rise and I pursued my passion. I entered medical school and I graduated as a doctor. I had an easy life and I was happy until that moment when I parked my brand new Mercedes in Baghdad University Hospital. Going to the theater complex to face the Republican guards and the Ba'ath Party members escorting three busloads of army deserters. They ordered us to abandon the elective surgery and start amputating these deserters' ears to brand them. The head of department refused. Based on the Hippocrates' oath, do no harm. They simply took him to the car park, they put a bullet in his head, and then they turned to the rest of us and they said, 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, we attracted your attention. Anyone share this gentleman's view? Please come forward. Otherwise, proceed with our orders. My father's words resonated in my head. Should I refuse and have a bullet in my head? Shall I obey the commands and live with guilt for the rest of my life? Oh, hang on, there is a female toilet. I can hide there, and I did. I spent five hours in the female toilet. Life was dark there like five years. From there onward, I become an escapee, a traitor, and the treatment for traitors is execution. My family smuggled me outside Iraq to Jordan. Jordan was not safe. And as an Iraqi national, the only country on this world, on this universe, that allows you a visa for 14 days was Malaysia. So I took the flight to KL. In KL, I met two young men who offered me help in return for my help to them with interpretation. They introduced me to Mahdi the smuggler. He asked me for a large sum of money and my passport, and he will come back next day with the next destination plan. I questioned him, how can I trust you? He got offended and he said to me, how dare you, I'm a respectable smuggler. <laughs> Two days later, I was in Jakarta, so he was. In Jakarta, I faced hundreds of people queuing, as Philip products say, waiting for asylum seeker somewhere. And it happened that I jumped that queue just because I was a doctor. So I was offered a VIP ticket to the next available brand new boat. I was crammed among 165 people on a leaky boat heading to the lucky land Australia. The sea was very rough, and just to make it a little bit harder, once we reached international waters, the skipper bailed out on a big gray ship with large numbers. Before he left, he gave us instructions. And he said, head straight. You will reach Christmas Island in 30 hours. If you miss, in two weeks you get to the mainland. And if you miss and you reach a wide, cold desert with a lot of penguins, head back, you've gone too far. <laughs> we got to Christmas Island. I spent five happy days in Christmas Island, and I saw a true Australian spirit, one of which, it was this officer who broke the law and put his job on the line, and he gave me his satellite phone to make the most important phone call in my life to tell my mom that I'm safe and she may not hear from me for a couple of years because I will end up in detention center. I did end up in detention center in Curtin. I was stripped of my identity and I was given a number. For 10 months, I was 982. It was hell on earth. I can't describe it better. My father's words resonated in my head again, so I challenged the establishment. And funny enough, the, the punishment was sending me to jail several times. By the way, West Australian jails are beautiful. <laughs> I had the loveliest time there. I was treated like a human being in the prison system in Australia. I strongly recommend that. <laughs> Just before the Sydney Olympics, people started, the Department of Immigration started processing numbers. And funny enough, my number, 982, slipped through the system. And it was like an hourglass, sands going down, and I was the only sand left in isolation by myself. For 40 days, I did not exist. That was the lowest time for me in my wheel of fortune. It was horrible. In isolation, what did I do? I had the last anatomy book. I studied my book, and thanks to Philip Roddock, I passed my exam as soon as I finished and got, got out of the detention. This is the detention center pictures, and that's how we spend our time, before the isolation. Finally, I was released, and I pursued my passion to do 
orthopedic surgery. I worked hard and I got a job. One year to the date, from the time I reached Australian, water, um, Australian soil, I received my first paycheck as a doctor. And within two years, I entered one of the most exclusive training programs, which is the Australian Orthopedic Training Scheme. I thought I'm at the top of the wheel again. Then I received a rude wake-up call. Two of my peer in our welcome dinner, they came to me and to my face they said, the Australian orthopedic training standard has dropped that much to allow a refugee to be one of us. I said, this did not faze me. I pursued my passion and I wanted to show these bastards that I can do it, and I did it. I finished the, <laughs> the orthopedic training scheme and I became an orthopedic surgeon. And I pursued my passion that I studied so much about making the Terminator. And I did my first few cases. And again, I presented my early results in a, in a national conference. And this time, I was faced with two of my senior colleagues coming to me. One of them shook my hand and he said, Munjid, I always knew you are crazy. Good on you. Keep going with this revolutionary technology. And the second one said to me, this is criminal. I'm sure Long Bay Jail has a room left for you, and I'll send you flowers. I understand where he come from, because he thinks that this is violate the traditional thinking of orthopedic surgery. After all, I'm making an, a robot that's sticking out of the skin and there is a risk of infection. However, I studied it, I researched it, I had a team that works with me, that believe in it, and it does work. This is Michael Swain. He's a British soldier who lost his limb, both of them in Afghanistan. Five years down the track, after being in a wheelchair, he walked his dog every day, he played golf, that's in his backyard, by the way, and he has his life back. But one of the happiest moments in my life is when Michael Swain was walking four weeks after the surgery back home, and his wife and his, daughter, his son were standing in the window, and the wife told the five-year-old child, come and watch Daddy walking back home. And he said, this is not true. This is not Daddy. Daddy doesn't walk. That brought tears to my eyes. I was honored to watch Michael Swain receiving his MBE honors in front of the Queen in Windsor Castle. And I am, though at the top of the wheel at the moment, unprepared for the next turn down. However, it is very honorable and I'm grateful that by being empowered at the top of the wheel that I can help a few more people to raise their position in the wheel up further. Thank you.